This week, we're reviewing a wine that I can best describe as like drinking liquid gold delivered to us from the gods. And in the tip of the week, we're going to talk about why is it we use oak in winemaking. All of that, coming up next. Hello and welcome to Wine This Week with Scott Leak. I'm cheating a little bit this week. We're doing an episode based on a region, not on a varietal. I'm really close because it's almost a single varietal. Sautern is a region in Bordeaux. It's a sub-region within Bordeaux in the southern part. And generally speaking, you're only gonna find two grapes in Sautern wines. They are Similion and Sauvignon Blanc, which just happen to be alphabetically the next two videos we're gonna do here. So I'll talk a little bit more about those particular varietals in the next two episodes. But what you need to know about Sauterne is, like I said, it's a region in southern Bordeaux, and it's pretty much unlike anywhere else on earth in terms of the style and type of wine they make, which is why I'm devoting an episode to it. Sauterne is unlike anything you've ever had, except maybe something called ice wine. Oftentimes it gets compared to port because they're both dessert wines, but port is made with red grapes, it's fortified, you know, it really doesn't have anything in common with Sauterne other than the fact that it's considered a dessert wine. Sauterne is going to be lower in alcohol. It's made in an entirely different way, and it's from two different white varietals. So the closest comparison is actually something called ice wine, which you'll find made in Canada. You can also find it in Germany. And what's interesting about ice wine is that the way they make that is they let the grapes sit on the vine so long and in, in like into winter until the grapes freeze and then they'll press the grapes while still kind of frozen. So what comes out is very concentrated sugar. There's not as much water that comes out because of its frozen nature. So it's more concentrated, it's sweeter, hence it's a dessert wine. Sauterne, however, is made by rotten grapes. And I bet you're thinking, wow, Scott, can't wait to try Sauterne now. Trust me, it's called noble rot. So, I mean, it's, it's gotta be good. Now, the technical term for noble rot is called botrytis. Botrytis occurs under certain conditions, usually in the autumn in this region in France, where due to the type of grapes they're using and due to the conditions, usually it's a damp morning followed by a warm afternoon, this rot begins to set in, this fungus begins to infect the grapes. It pokes little holes into the skin and, and kind of sucks out some of the water. So when they do go to press the grapes, some of that water's already extracted what you're left with is more concentrated fruit. And somehow this noble rot actually adds some really cool aromatics to the wine as well. So as gross as this might sound, wine from rotten grapes can actually be really delicious. So much so that there are bottles of wine out there that are extremely expensive and very long lived when you're talking about Sauterne. I've got two examples here today. I'm only going to open the one. I just want to kind of showcase the fact that Sauterne can usually be found in full bottles, but probably even more often found in half bottles because you generally don't want to drink a whole bottle of this stuff, even if you're sharing it. So I'm going to have the half bottle today, but know that the half bottle is usually going to start around $30, I'm going to say. Larger bottles, usually twice as much or more. This happens to be a 2009 we're opening, and this is from one of the Premier Grand Crus, so a little bit pricier, you can get less, less expensive ones. I think I paid about $30 for this, but again, this is a 2009, probably a little bit harder to find this vintage now. I'm really looking forward to this. It's gonna be at a good spot because it's aged a little bit. This is now 13 years old. Sauternes can last a really, really long time. I have seen bottles of Chateau de Chem, on restaurant menus, I think the oldest I've ever seen was maybe a bottle of 1895, which was going for about $11,000 a bottle. It can actually last that long. So this is a great wine, much like port, where you can buy this and have it as a gift. So like I mentioned in my port video, which I'll, I'll link below, I talk about how great, great of a gift port can be because you can buy it for birth years. In this case, I happen to have an 07 and an 09, and b below me here, I have more 2011s, which happen to be the three years that my daughters were born. So I'm hoping I can enjoy some of these wines once they're in their 20s and 30s. Let's get on to today's wine, which is Chateau Giraud. This is the 2009 Sauterne. Again, Chateau Giraud is one of the premier Grand Cru Class A's of 1855 just one of the classification systems of Bordeaux for left bank wines. And that is way more of a pour than you should do for Sauterne, but it's good, I like it. I'm gonna go nuts today. Now, as you can see right now, this is a very different color than 
most white wines. So get a little paper there for you. I mean, this stuff is definitely a whole nother level of color. This thing is so gorgeous. I mean, this is like amber, almost orange in color. It's like drinking liquid gold. Okay, on the smell. <laughs> oh my goodness, I haven't had one of these in so long. I'm just gonna take a minute. Sweet, my goodness. I was gonna curse, so I just stopped it sweet. It does smell sweet. There is, um, there's floral in here that's like gorgeous honeysuckle. Apricots really coming through, maybe even a hint of coconut. Ginger, there's some spices, there's some smoke and vanilla, which is gonna come from the oak. I'll talk about the oak later on, which is yet another reason why Sauternes is so expensive. They use oak. It's very hard to make Sauternes as well. Again, there's rotten grapes. They Some places like this one, they will actually hand pick each and every grape. You're getting less juice out of it, so you get less wine per acre. That's why it ends up being more expensive and not a lot of the places try making it. Some vintages, they don't even get the botrytis, so they can't even make it. All right, on to the taste. Mm. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh my goodness. Freaking delicious. This is so good. Oh my God. Okay. I'm going to focus. It is a sweet wine. So on the sweet to dry scale, I'm going to call this medium, maybe even a little bit medium plus on the sweetness. It's not, it's not super high alcohol. I want to say this is, this is 13 and a half. I'm not getting much burn on it. Again, compared to port, which could be like 19, 20%, this is very different, but the sweetness is balanced beautifully by the fruit and the acidity on this. So generally speaking, when you're gonna have a Sauterne, you're gonna find that the sweetness is fairly high, but it's really, really well balanced by good crisp acidity as well. And that's part of the reason why the Semillon is often balanced with a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc. The Sauvignon Blanc will add some of that balance with an extra acidity. The body on this is, gorgeous. It's so viscous and I love this feeling. It's like, this isn't going to sound great, but it's almost like if you put some olive oil in your mouth, the way it just kind of coats it, that weight of it, it's very similar, obviously very different taste, but from the body and the feel perspective, it's a lot like having some, some olive oil in your mouth. And then the flavor intensity is just amazing. These flavors are so pronounced. Again, that apricot came through really strong. I did get the ginger. I got some spice. Maybe a little bit of lemon and some stone fruits, more of the apricot, peach. Um, there's a little bit of tropical in there. Maybe some type of like mango or papaya, something, there's something tropical I put, put my finger on. Oh, pineapple, it's pineapple. It is so hard just to sip this thing. I just wanna keep going and going. The nice thing is, I didn't talk about this yet too, gorgeous finish. This thing just lingers in your mouth. There's this like candied ginger, that's what it is. There's this candied ginger that is just lingering on my palate to go with these like nice dried apricot flavors. I can't stop saying how gorgeous this wine is. It's freaking delicious. Let's talk a little bit about sauterne and food pairings. There's some really cool things you can do contrasting different flavors. So one of the things that I think is really great to do with Sauterne is mixing sweet and salty. So Sauterne with something like a blue cheese. So if you're doing charcuterie, get some blue cheese in there, maybe a little honey on a crack. Ooh, there's honey in this too. Forgot about that. So, so, so some blue cheese, some honey, really gonna go well with this. Get that sweet and salty thing going. Also, if you wanna do sweet and savory, classic pairing with Sauterne is foie gras. I'm not gonna talk about the controversy around some foie gras, that's up to you to decide whether or not you wanna do it. Just know that that's a classic pairing and one of the occasions where although it's a dessert wine, if you're gonna go out to a nice restaurant that has foie gras and you have it as maybe a starter or you know included in the entree, it's okay to get yourself a glass of sauter and they'll probably serve about two ounces, maybe three ounces and have that with your foie gras in the middle of the meal. 
I even know some people that will compare or will have sauterne with steak, as weird as that sounds, because you're going again with this kind of sweet with savory that you're doing with the foie gras can actually apply to steak as well, but you want it kind of meaty, maybe even fatty like a ribeye. That's gonna go well with it as it does with foie gras. Lastly, dessert wines go great with desserts. You wanna make sure that if you're gonna have it with something sweet, that the sweetness levels are pretty close to each other. If you have creme brulee and you have a non-sweet wine, it's gonna make the wine taste even drier and, and maybe a little austere. So something like creme brulee, great pairing with, um, with Sauternes. So give that a try as well. Scoring this wine, balance is amazing. Like I said, it's got sweetness, but it's balanced with great acidity and just high concentration of fruit that just makes it outstanding. Great points for balance. The length on this is amazing. The intensity of the flavors is very high. The complexity of it, there's all kinds of different notes here. There's primary, secondary, even there's some tertiary notes because this one's been aged a little while. I don't know if I've scored a wine nine points this year, but I'm scoring this nine points. This is just, it's decadent would be the right word to describe it. Again, if you haven't tried a sauterne before, certainly one to give it a try, even if you're not necessarily a fan of sweet wines, if you have the right food pairing with it, this might end up being phenomenal. Is there a more exciting tip of the day that I could talk about than wood? Specifically talking about oak and why is it oak is used in wine? Well, for starters, pine would probably be pretty gross, but oak is used in wine because, well, we didn't always have glass bottles. And when you think about thousands of years ago, what did they put wine in? Most likely it was something like clay. And sometime around, somewhere in the 1600s, somebody realized, hey, wait a minute, we can use wood, put it in the barrel form, put the wine in the barrel, and now you can actually roll it. You can move a lot more wine in a lot easier way. The other interesting thing they found was that the wood actually imparted some good benefits on the wine. Number one, wood is ever so slightly permeable, so the wine would have this mild oxidation that would soften the alcohol, soften the tannins, and then some of the chemical compounds from the wood got imparted on the wine and added some cool new flavors to it. So for the most part, it ended up being a really good change. And then clever winemakers started to figure out, oh, what are some of the other variables we can change here? So there's four main ones I wanna to talk through real quick. Number one, the winemakers could mess with and, and change the size of the barrel to affect the wine. So if you get a really, really large barrel, there's not as much surface of the wine touching the barrel. So it's a way to maybe minimize the impact of the impact of the wood on the wine. If you want a really small barrel, you're going to have more surface area of the wine touching it and therefore imparting more of the flavors on that. Secondly, you can affect what type of wood you're using. So there's different types of, or specifically the, the toasting within it. So the whole wine making, barrel making process uh, is actually kind of expensive. You get about two barrels um, per tree. So that's why wines that are made with real oak tend to be a bit more expensive because the process of making the barrel is expensive, the process of getting the oak is expensive. It adds more cost to the wine. And winemakers can customize the amount of toastiness or char, as you might hear it in terms of like whiskey aging. They talk about char a little bit more than toasting, but you can get, you know, medium or medium minus or medium plus toasting on the wine or on the barrel, and that's gonna impact different flavors on the wine as well. Then there's the type of oak, and there is usually American oak and French oak that's discussed. Once in a while you hear about Slovenian oak or Hungarian oak, but basically the difference between European oak and American oak and I do hear myself, I know this is boring, I'll make this quick. But the difference between American oak and a French oak or any type of European oak, the European oak is a lot more dense. If you look at the rings within the tree, they're closer together. So the tighter the rings are, the tighter the wood is, it's less permeable. So it's not gonna have as much of the oxidation, it's not gonna impart the same chemical compounds on the wine that American oak does. So wines like Cabernets from Napa or Tempranillo from Rioja, those are big, bold wines, and actually American oak works better because it needs that type of wood to soften the alcohol, soften the tannins, and impart more of those flavors of the vanilla, the toastiness that comes through, and that's why there's sometimes a difference between American and French oak. If you were to use American oak on Pinot Noir or Saint Gervais, it would probably be pretty overwhelming, which is why you normally see 
French oak used for some of those softer, more delicate wines. The last factor a winemaker can mess with when it comes to the different types of oak or how oak is used, and that is the difference between new versus old oak. Once in a while, if you look at a label or you read about a wine, it might say 20% new oak. Well, the way they do that actually is that, let's say all the wine that's gonna go into production for that vintage is gonna be in 100 barrels. Well, 20 of those barrels will be brand new and the other 80 will be old barrels that have been reused maybe one or two seasons. That's about all you can do with it. But if it's been used before, it's not gonna give off as much of the flavors of the oak because it's already done so in a previous vintage. So what they might do is take 20 barrels, 80 barrels, 80 ones are being reused and then they blend them all together before they put them in a bottle and that is how a bottle might have only 20% new oak. So like I said, those are a couple ways that oak can affect a wine. If you have any more questions about it, feel free to put them in the comments below. Otherwise, hopefully this was more than enough information about wood. Thank you for watching another episode of Wine This Week. I hope you enjoyed it. Join me next time for our episode on Sauvignon Blanc. Until then, keep trying new wines and as always, cheers.